following summer when I was 16 years old, uh, my uncle Tyler had come back into town and like he said, you know, he ran his business during the summers and he'd go out to, uh, to New Mexico for the winters when it'd get cold and there was no work, you know. He'd go up there to relax and he'd save his money and stuff like that. So, uh, so he'd come back and he got a few concrete jobs and roofing jobs and a bunch of different jobs and he was doing good. Uh, he bought a dump truck. He bought a bunch of sports cars. He had like a Corvette, like a 1970s Corvette. He had like a 1990s or 80s Camaro. And I mean, these cars were real nice cars. He had a few trucks, a little house. He had, he had stuff going on for him. He, he wasn't doing too bad for just getting out of prison a few years prior. So, uh, but this, this time in my life, you know, I was, I was pretty wild. You know, like I say, I was getting in all kinds of stuff. I was having sex with all kinds of women, you know, I was in, in the drugs. And not just weed, now it progressed, you know, I was doing a little bit of uh, mushrooms. I'd do a little bit of LSD, you know. Uh, uh, I'd even try snorting cocaine every now and then. And me and my friends, we even smoked opium and hash. So I was getting into all kinds of drugs. And I was totally off the deep end, totally off the deep end. And, and I was a naturally skinny guy anyways. I was about uh, 120 pounds, 115 pounds. And I was already like five foot 11, five foot 10. But I was real skinny, you know? But it's crazy though because, but I had a lot of heart so I could fight and you know, always stand my ground. So I was no punk, but I was a skinny dude. But I was a dangerous skinny dude, you could say, because I was on all these drugs and everything else like that. So I worked for my uncle. We do all these concrete jobs, roofing jobs, or whatever. And he would usually pay us every Friday. That was a deal because he started getting everything in priority. He would, he would pay all of us every Friday. So every Friday, that was a deal. We'd go down to his house, and I would smoke a joint with him, and I'd get paid, and I would most likely leave or just hang out a little bit longer and smoke more weed or whatever, you know, with my uncle. And uh. I found out some things about my uncle later on, you know, but I didn't find out these things later on until maybe I was 18 or so like that, 19 years old. But, uh, so this one time I went to go get paid from my uncle and my mom dropped me off over there. My mom took me to my uncle's house and she says, here you go. And she dropped me off and she had some other stuff to do. And I didn't have a car then, you know, I was 16 years old, but I didn't have my own car then. And uh, she dropped me off, and and I went in to go get paid. And my uncle paid me, and you know, uh, and I had a joint rolled up. I said, you ready to smoke one? And he's all, no, no, you, you just might as well just go ahead and leave. And I was like, what are you talking about, leave? And he's all, oh, I got some business I'm trying to handle. Just go ahead and go, ahead and go home, you know. And I, was, I wasn't really understanding what he was laying down. But uh, I could tell something was different with him. And I could tell he was uh, smoking some meth and stuff like that. And he didn't want anybody around when he's doing those kind of drugs, you know. And so I thought it was real weird. So I told him, well, how am I going to get home? Are you going to give me a ride home? Or, what? or do you just expect me to walk all the way home? And so he's all, well, here you go. And he hands me the keys to his Corvette. And he's all, go ahead and take this. And I just thought like, what in the hell? This is like his favorite car. He doesn't let no one drive it. And he's just handing me this keys to his Corvette, 1970s Corvette. And he says, go ahead and take it. And I'm 16 years old. And I'm like, and I didn't understand it, but I was like, all right, well, whatever. And so I went out there and I jumped in the Corvette and I even burned out the tires in his driveway and I took off. So I took off and I was like, well, I guess it's going to be a pretty lit weekend, right? So, uh, so I go around town and I start showing a couple of my friends, yeah, look, I got my uncle's Corvette, this and that, you know, all this stuff going on. So I started getting all kinds of stuff rounded up. So I just got paid. I had like four or $500. I had like an ounce of weed on me. Uh, I went and bought a few hits of acid from somebody, you know. Uh, I went and bought a quarter or a half gram of some meth from somebody, 
or coke I don't even remember what it was and then I bought a fifth of 100 proof I think it was Jack Daniels or Jim Beam I don't remember but uh so I took off the t-tops and I left the t-tops at my house and I was driving around all over the place and I rolled up a couple joints too before I started driving around I was driving around in this Corvette 16 years old and I thought I was hot shit you know so I was smoking all these joints and everything cruising around and I had all these drugs on me I would cruise around and I would crack the ball up and take a chug now and then and I would just cruise around in the Corvette smoking doobies and you know and I was doing acid at the same time I popped a couple hits of acid and then I would just pull over just so I could snort some lines you know and then that was it so it was probably cocaine pull over snort it but I was stupid you know I was racing kids on their motorcycles and racing cars that thought that they were cool and, and I was 16 years old with a really nice Corvette racing everybody with all these jugs on me that's how stupid I was acting at this age but this is my testimony and this is how it was so yeah I was doing all these stupid stuff so so I ended up keeping his car for about four days and then finally he called me up after four days and says hey you want to come drop out of that car you want to come drop me off my car and I says yeah I'll be right over so yeah he was on meth for like four days you know probably smoking a lot of it too so I went back and I dropped off his car and everything like that and uh shortly after this shortly after this uh he ended up doing a lot more drugs and you know he started getting skinnier you know i could tell because when he got out of prison he was beefed up he had a lot of muscle on him but i could tell he started getting skinnier he started doing a lot more drugs a lot of his jobs weren't getting finished and uh so he's basically repeating the same cycle that he went through that put him in prison the first time and uh, so some of the people he wasn't finishing the jobs for like he would bid, bid the roof to do one of the roofs for let's just say for example $16,000 or not not that much like $6,000 and he would start doing the roof and then he would after he had get on drugs and spend some of the money and whatever he didn't have enough money to finish his jobs so he would go back and, and lie to the owners and say well we f we found some structural issues with your roof and and uh, I think you need to fix it the right way and to get it fixed the right way it's going to be another five thousand dollars and he would do this kind of stuff and they just believed it but after the work wasn't getting done they'd bring in more contractors and question what was going on what was this and the guy the contractor says there's nothing wrong with the structure he should have just replaced the roof and that was it he shouldn't be around for no three months three and a half months this should take a few days and he should be done and so the owners would get mad and they would want to press charges on my uncle and so they end up doing that they end up pressing charges like I think like two different people that he was doing work for end up pressing charges for on him for just leaving, evading the property and not doing any work or nothing like that. So, so like the cops were looking for my uncle and he was getting all strung out and he was leaving town and and it's really weird because me and my brother met him in a motel one day and he just got back from New Mexico after the cops were looking for him and he was all strung out on meth. You could see it in his eyes, you could see it in his face his body shrunk up he looked all confused he was fighting with his girlfriend like you could just tell like he's a mess I can't believe he is like this I cannot believe it but what do you do you can't do nothing he's gotta face the music he, he done the crime he's gotta do the time so he ended up getting put back in prison but this sentence I think they gave him seven years so he went to prison when I was, I think I was right around 17 years old. I left off last time talking about where my Uncle Talleray was uh, taken back into prison. You know, he was taken back into prison right about when I was about 17 years old. 
at this time in my life I was really messed up myself also I was doing all kinds of drugs you know like I say uh, LSD mushrooms hash opium marijuana some cocaine here and there and also some meth here and there and I was selling weed for the most part I was still working too I was still working construction jobs or just whatever I could do you know uh, to support my habit and also pay the bills and help my mother out and stuff like that so so my uncle he got sentenced back and I think they gave him a sentence for like another seven or eight years in prison and this is when I was right about uh, 17 years old so it would have put us probably about 2001 maybe somewhere in there and uh, before this time right around the year 2000 my uncle Daniel also got sent to prison my uncle Daniel got sent to prison uh, right around the year 2000 and it was for some some kind of sex related charge I don't, I don't know if uh, I don't really know the whole story behind it or whatever but I guess he got some sexual related charge when he was drunk or something so he ended up having to serve like probably about four or five years my uncle Daniel did so uh it was real crazy and then right around the year 2000 uh my uncle ronnie that was living in uh phoenix arizona he's he went to college and he got a bachelor's degree he was pretty good in college he had his head on his shoulders uh he was pretty much getting into bodybuilding had a pretty good body on him and stuff like that and we didn't really know too much about him just that he had a business going on down there and we would just see him during the holidays and that was pretty much it and my uncle my uncle gary and my uncle ronnie my uncle ronnie was the youngest and then my uncle gary was the second youngest they were pretty tight they were pretty close together and uh they would always be always be hanging around with each other and then the my uncle teller and my uncle daniel they would always hang around with each other. It was it was kind of like a weird situation. But uh, right around the year 2000, we found out that uh, that my uncle Ronnie, the one that had a paint business in Phoenix, that he he got real sick, and uh, we eventually found out that he was HIV positive. So he had AIDS and uh, and he was gay and stuff, but we never knew we we never knew no one in the family ever knew he just kept it a secret from all of us and he never acted gay around any of us nothing we just didn't know you know but yeah he contracted aids and everything and after he got aids i think he lasted like maybe nine or ten months and he got real sick and he ended up passing away so that was one of the first devastating blows to the family is uh he got real sick and he ended up passing away so right around this time uh so that happened when i was about uh 16 years old when he passed away 16 or 17 years old so let's fast forward so my uncle daniel's already in prison he's already been there one year and then uh my uncle talleray gets sentenced to prison also so my uncle daniel has like a four or five year charge that he's got to serve and then uh my uncle Tallery has like a seven or eight year charge that he has to serve and they're both serving time in the same penitentiary there in wyoming in rollins wyoming and uh it's real crazy the way things happen but you know that's that's what it is and uh so shortly after this you know i'm 17 years old and uh and I'm partying, you know, getting in all kinds of mischief, you know, nothing changes with my life. I'm still raising hell and stuff like that. And right around this time period is when, uh, like I talked about my grandpa, my grandfather, he had some apartments. And he had, I think there was like 15 units in them. And my brother went to go help him fix up those apartments and clean them up and then... 
my grandpa just says, well, if you're going to help me with these apartments, you could just live in one of them. So he, he let my brother stay there rent free, you know, just, just help fix it up and help him do what he's got to do. So around this time, my grandfather and my brother were cleaning out a storage unit that was uh, connected to the apartments. And they come across some black magic books. And, you know, it was real funny because they were cleaning out the storage and seeing whatever was good in there so they could sell it. And they come across these black magic books and they, they got real interested. So they stopped cleaning out the storage and everything else and they just focused on these black magic books. And they took them into my grandfather's apartment and they, they sat down and they started looking through them, reading through them, seeing what they had to say. Within about a few weeks, uh, my grandfather lived in a, a two-bedroom apartment in his apartment units. And uh, he sold the house that was that was next door to my mother's house. He sold that, got rid of it, and uh, used that money to buy those apartments and to invest in those. Well, he lived in an apartment that was a two-bedroom apartment. And he transferred his spare bedroom into like a, a little room where they could do black magic. So they started buying all kinds of herbs, oils, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and my grandfather and my brother would go in that room and do whatever those black magic books were telling them to do. You know, set up rituals and stuff like that. And I don't really know all that's happened. You know, whatever happened just was between my brother and my grandfather. And my brother showed, told me some of the things, but he wouldn't tell me everything, you know. And after this time period, uh, my brother started getting real heavy into it also, him and my grandfather. And, and my brother, he was always messing around with multiple women. And he would tell me, he says, I could have any woman I want, and I could have them do whatever I want, you know, because and I was like, what? And he would tell me how he would take a picture of the woman or some of their hair and do certain rituals over them. And it was crazy because it really did work. You know, he would find women at gas stations or whatever and just meet them the first day. Next thing you know, like a week later, they were living together. That, that woman was paying all of his bills, you know, serving him on hand and feet with meals and just doing whatever he, he wanted pretty much. And it's really interesting, but it's like that that's how crazy things got. And so uh, my brother was kind of in his own world with that black magic stuff. And, and I didn't get, you know, I didn't get involved in none of that. And I asked him, you know, here and there, and, and he would tell me certain things. And he even told me one time that he talked to a demon before and, and the demon just would tell him all kinds of stuff, and, and that was it. And it sounds far-fetched, you know, but once you get into that world and all that kind of cultic stuff, you know, it sounds like unbelievable stories, but once you dive deep into them, you know, that stuff is actually true, you know, and does really, they really see stuff and hear stuff that is unreal, you know, so, so I believe him that he was uh, communicating with some kind of entity or something like that. And so uh, so my brother was doing his own thing, and so was I. You know, he was into black magic and smoking weed and doing drugs, too. My brother was. He, he got into meth here and there, but he wouldn't do it like... He would just do it once in a while. His main thing was smoking weed and uh, focusing on black magic and working for my grandfather. And at this same time, uh, you know, my mother... She started working two jobs. She she was working Blue Cross Blue Shield and then she'd work at Taco John's just for some bingo money or whatever. And so around this time, like I say, I was still pretty wild and stuff. I was still running the streets, doing all kinds of drugs, selling weed and everything. And I went to this party and uh, there wasn't very many people there, maybe maybe 15 people there, which just like a smoke a weed party so we went over there and it was in a basement a uh, basement apartment underneath the house and we were down there just smoke weed just hanging out with these people that I that I grew up with and uh, next thing you know we heard a knock on the door and we're like what so we went and opened the door and like two cops come in and they're like everybody sit down and so we're all sitting down and we're like what the hell 
And we sprayed stuff so we knew they couldn't smell the weed and stuff like that. And then they says, we were sitting right there at that window looking down in here. We saw each and every one of you guys smoking weed down here. And we sat here and watched you guys for 15 minutes. And we looked over at the window and yeah, it was cracked and everything. He could clearly see in there. So they wrote us all tickets. Everybody that they seen there that was smoking weed, everybody in the house got uh, possession of marijuana tickets, you know, just from that. And so they threw me back on probation. And I was like, sucks, you know. So this is my second offense for marijuana, uh, possession of marijuana. And so they put me on a year long probation. And it didn't really change me much. I still like, back then I was still so foggy headed. Like I was like, well, I'm still gonna smoke weed. And I had to go in every week and do a, a piss test so they could check my system for weed, but I was like under the assumption that I'm still gonna smoke weed, but I'll just clean out like a few days before I have to go in and do a piss test, you know what I mean? And so that's what I did. I uh, I would smoke weed, you know, and then right, I'd smoke weed for throughout the weekend, and then Monday through Wednesday, and then Thursday, Friday, or whatever, you know, or by Tuesday, you know, like four days before I would I would start drinking a lot of water and, and clean up my system and I'd go in there and I'd pee clean all the time. So I got it down like, oh, this is a, a little deal I could, I could do. I could still smoke my weed and still pee clean. So I'll be fine.